Okay, so I'm Philip Boys. I come from the Office of Scholarly Communications over at the University Library. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, open access funder policies and what we're going to do to hopefully, well, what we are doing to hopefully make it a little bit easier for you to comply with them. So, open access as an idea is fairly straightforward. Um, if you publish something in a journal, typically they might put that onto their website, but that will be behind a paywall. So it's fine if you're in an institution like this that has nice expensive subscriptions that give you access to everything. But if you're not in an institution that has those kind of resources, then you have to pay money to get access to those articles. And even within Cambridge, and I did my PhD here, and there were a huge range of things I needed for my PhD that I couldn't get access to because we didn't subscribe. So even within an institution like this, it can be really useful. Um, so, open access is just getting rid of those paywalls and making research available to everybody who wants to read it. Now that's simple, but you'll find that how people interpret it varies from person to person or organisation to organisation. So, you'll find that funders will have a particular definition of what they mean by open access when they say that you have to make your work open access. You'll find that the publishers very often put forward a slightly different interpretation when they're saying here are our options. So one thing that you typically see is that your funders will define open access in a whole bunch of ways. Some of them involve the final version of your article being immediately open access and pay you paying the publisher for that. So there'll be a whole range of other ones that might be completely free and you just make your manuscript available on a university repository for example. Publishers will often just use open access to refer to the one where you give them money. So if you don't know better, then you go in, you think, I need to make my work open access, you pay the publisher's money, and you might not have to actually do that. And the university also has its own views on you know, what constitutes proper open access and what doesn't. Um, so quite often the kind of language about open access, the discourse is often structured around compliance, and it's quite a negative message. And so I want to start off, I am going to talk about compliance for most of the talk, but I do want to kind of begin just by talking a little bit about what the positive sides of open access are and why you might want to do it. So there's two sides to that, what it can do for you and why you might want to do it. So as I've kind of alluded to already, the big benefit of open access is that it lets you access research from around the world for free. Um, I'll send these slides around later so you don't need to try and copy this down. There's a whole range of resources. It's a bit fuzzy actually, but there are all of these resources that let you find open access articles. You'll find that Google Scholar or even normal Google are just quite, you know, they're among the best at finding these things. So they're not difficult to get hold of. Uh, one more place that you'll find stuff is the university repository. I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more depth just because it's going to be something we'll come back to when we talk about the compliance side of things. So if you go to repository.cam.ac.uk, that's where you'll find it. In the past, you may have heard it called DSpace at Cambridge. Um, we're actually in the middle of upgrading and rebranding the repository. So at the moment, it's still got the DSpace and the repository branding on there. It still looks quite old fashioned, as you'll see in a minute. Um, yeah, it still looks more or less like that. Hopefully in the next couple of months, it should be modernized. It should look like something from the 21st century rather than the 20th. And the name of it is going to change as well. So we had a competition at the end of last year to give it a more interesting name than just repository. Um, and it's going to be called Apollo once we get the new um, skin on the repository. But this is more or less what it looks like. It, there's a whole bunch of collections structured by departments in there. Um, this is the biochemistry one. You can see there's a little introduction text and then it's got different sub-collections within there. So I don't know how well you can read this, probably not very well. But so you've got one for kind of data, one for scholarly works, so that's journal articles and one for theses. You can put in as many of those sub-collections as you want, depending on how you want to structure it. Uh, and if you go in there, you can find articles that people have uploaded, and you can access them for free. Um, most people don't find things in the repository by browsing it. Uh, as you can see from that, it's not the world's best interface right now. So most people come to it through Google. So what you'll typically find if you Google an article title is that the first one will be the official published journal results, and then the second one is the free version in our repository. And this is what an article page looks like. So you've got um, the abstract there, big information. Um, you've, got, uh, so you've got the DOI, which links you straight through to the final version. 
um, if you go to the full item record, you have all the citation information that people need to cite the journal version of your article. So journal name, issue number, page numbers, all the stuff that you expect. Uh, it's also worth saying that nothing goes in here without it being allowed by the journal's copyright policy. So we will check to make sure that the journal allows you to put things in here. And if they don't allow you to do that, obviously we're not going to make it available in this way. Most journals will say it's fine for you to put a manuscript up like this, but they will say they want you to embargo it for a certain amount of time after publication. And we'll come back to those embargoes later when we talk about compliance. So that's what you can get out of open access, is finding things. But why might you want to make your own work open access? There's a whole range of arguments that often get put forward. I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but I'll pull out a couple of them. So one thing that people sometimes say is there are higher citation rates for open access. There is a bit of debate over that, but it does seem to be the case. If you want your research to influence policy, whether in the government or kind of business, things like that, then it's really useful if people can read your, um, your material. The public can access your findings. So this obviously, the importance will vary from discipline to discipline, but in some subjects it's, it can be quite useful for the public to be able to read research. Um, one that you'll see a lot is this idea of a kind of ethical dimension to open access, that regardless of who your individual project is funded by, you are in receipt of public funds because the university is publicly funded. So if the public have paid for your research through their tax, then you'll see to argue that they shouldn't have to pay again in order to read it. So that's the one that you'll just quite often put forward. The one that obviously focuses minds a lot is the compliance with grant rules argument. And you know, for all these carrots and nice shiny reasons why you might want to do it, ultimately it's, the funders are asking us to do it and there's an awful lot of money riding on this and that's what's led to the creation of the university's open access service and it's what's really focused minds in the last couple of years to kind of expand our communications and get people really doing this. So this is a very brief kind of schematic timeline of some of the major changes that have happened in the last few years. In 2013, the research councils announced a joint policy. So they've had, some of them have had individual policies for a long time. Um, in 2013, they all got together and agreed a single um, united policy. And that was when the university's open access service was set up. It's when I started working for it as well, so um, I've been there right since the start. In 2014, HEFCI, the Higher Education Funding Council, announced a policy as well, and that's what I'm going to talk about for most of today. Um, hopefully you'll have heard of this. This is the one that's tied into the REF. I'm guessing I don't need to explain what the REF is to anyone here. Please put your hand up if I do. Um, Basically, I'll go through that in more detail, but it says that if you want to be eligible for the next REF, your article needs to be open access. So that's a massive deal for the university, and it should be a massive deal for each of you because it's going to affect you regardless of who your project is funded by. That's not actually being enforced yet. So um, you can see there, 2016. In April, that's when the policy is going to be, start to be enforced. So they've given us two years to get people used to it, to get our systems in place. But from April of this year, every article that the university publishes needs to be made open access. Otherwise, if when the next ref comes around, if we want to submit that, we can't. The final thing just to draw attention to is the COAF policy. So is anybody here Wellcome Trust funded? Um, yeah, I thought that would be the case. So Wellcome have had a policy now for 10 years. I'm sure you all know about it. It's been very well widely publicised. Traditionally within the university, that was managed by the School of Biological Sciences. Um, what happened at, in October of 2014 was that Wellcome got together with a bunch of other biomedical charities, so people like Cancer Research UK, British Heart Foundation, Arthritis Research UK. Um, and they agreed, not quite a single policy, but a sort of more or less single policy, which Wellcome is administering. And they're all, They've all put money together into a single pot, which again is being administered by Wellcome. Within the university, the change that happened in October was that this, the Wellcome Trust pot of money stopped being administered by biological sciences and got folded into the, white, the kind of general open access service. So it's now managed in the same way as the Research Council funding. 
and I'll talk about the process for getting that money later on. So those are the main changes so far. There's not been any big changes last year. It's all just been a matter of getting people aware of the hefty policy and preparing for that coming into force in April. So as you'll have gathered from that, an awful lot of research money is going to be dependent on this, as well as a lot of people's careers and things when the ref rolls around. So it's really important that we get this right. Now, we know that you know, your researchers, you're not, you've got better things to do with your time than go tr scrabbling around in publisher copyright policies, trying to work out what it is that you need to do for, to make your funders happy and whether or not a journal allows you to do it. It's really kind of it can be incredibly complicated. None of the policies are quite the same as each other. So the Wellcome Trust policy is not the same as um, the Research Council's policy. Neither of them are the same as the Hefty policy. They're all slightly different, and each of the publishers also has slightly different policies on, in terms of what they allow you to do. Some of them even have different policies within the same publisher from journal to journal, so it's not a straightforward landscape. Uh, and that's why the university set up our service. The idea is that, um, sorry, that's the wrong slide, that we will help you navigate that as much of it as possible, we will take away from you and we can do it for you. So I'll go through how that works later on. But in theory, and hopefully in practice as well, um, we should mean that you basically don't have to worry too much about any of the policy side of things. You just tell us about your article and we can sort it out for you. So which policies apply to you? Well, you probably have worked this out, but it can be more than one. So the Hefke policy applies to everybody uh, because everybody receives Hefke funding in some way from the university by using its infrastructure and everybody might want to be included in the next ref. So it's going to apply to everyone, even PhD students who at the moment are not eligible for the ref. In five, six years time, they may well be. So everyone needs to worry about this. But then depending on who has funded the article itself, additional policies can apply. So let's say you're acknowledging funding from BBSRC and the Wellcome Trust. You've then got three policies to worry about. The Hefty one, the Research Council one, and the Wellcome Trust policy, the COAF one. So I'm just going to go into the Hefty policy in a bit more detail now. This says that peer-reviewed articles and conference proceedings have to be submitted to an institutional or subject repository when they're accepted for publication if you want them to be eligible for the next ref. So there's a few things to kind of pull out of that. The first thing is what it applies to. It's peer-reviewed articles, so it's not things like invited reviews or um, letters if they're not peer-reviewed. Um, you know, what constitutes a review or a letter, again, varies from discipline to discipline. But if you're writing an editorial or something, it probably doesn't apply to that. Um, if you're writing books, I'm not, I doubt that many of you are writing books, but uh, those also wouldn't be covered. Um, conference proceedings, if it's only conference proceedings that are published in a journal. So if it has an ISSN, then it's going to be covered. If it's published in a book, again, I doubt that probably applies to many of you. But if it was, then that wouldn't be covered. It can be a little complicated. Um, if you're not sure, then please do send it to us and we can sort it out. Uh, the second thing to draw attention to is that it has to be an institutional or subject repository. So let's say you're publishing in an entirely open access journal like PLOS. They put everything up on their website, it's all freely available. That in itself is not enough to comply with the policy. It has to be housed somewhere else on a repository. And the reason for that, it might seem counterintuitive, but it's because publishers, well some publishers more than others, have not covered themselves with glory in how they've managed this so far. We have an awful lot of problems with publishers who take money and then either don't make it available, they make it available in the wrong way, they make it available for a while and they take it down. So Hefke have just said, we can't trust the publishers to do this, we want it available somewhere else. Um, the third thing to pull out is probably the most important one, and that's that this is, has to be done when things are accepted for publication. It's not when things are published, and it's not in five or six years' time when you're deciding what you want to submit to the ref. Um, they want it done now. So I mentioned earlier the idea that publishers will let you put things into a repository, but they'll usually 
say that you have to embargo it for a certain amount of time after publication. Hefke are happy for that to happen. So long as it's in the repository within three months of acceptance, it can be embargoed, that's fine. But they say that they have maximum embargoes that are allowed, and that's going to be 12 months for you. And the vast majority of publishers will allow that, so it shouldn't be a problem. Um, and this is a piece of un kind of university interpretation of the policy, which was agreed at the high levels of kind of university administration, which is that since at the time of acceptance and at publication, you don't know which articles you might want to submit to the next ref, you might have an idea, but you don't know for sure. The only safe course of action is for us to make everything open access. And clearly, Hefke have designed the policy with that in mind. They want to get as much open access stuff out there as possible. So obviously this requires a new step in your publishing processes. Traditionally, <coughs> authors don't have a great deal to do with the university when it comes to publishing. You know, it's something between you and the publisher. You don't have to tell the university. You don't have to send us your article to check, be checked or anything like that. Um, this is going to require a change. It's going to require you to send us your manuscripts at acceptance so that we can sort out this deposit in the repository for you. And that's why Hefke told us about the policy two years before it was going to be enforced because they know that it requires a big change in people's behaviour and for a big institution like this obviously it's a huge job for us to communicate this policy and get people used to it. So when we say that we can put a version of the article into the repository and we'd like it, you to send it to us, what version are we talking about? Um, this is again a little fuzzy but this is a kind of rough um, diagram of the publication process. You submit a version, it gets peer reviewed, you might make some changes, it then gets accepted by the journal. And that version that's accepted, what's called the author's accepted manuscript, is the version that we're interested in. We're not in particularly interested in the proofs and we're not interested in the final version in the first instance. And the reason for that is that once you sign a copyright agreement um, or the journal type sets it or formats it in any way. That, again, it varies from journal to journal, but most of the time that's going to become the journal's property. And it really restricts what you can do with that version of the article. Whereas the manuscripts version, most of the time, is much more liberal in terms of how you can use it. And that's usually the version that we can put into the repository. There are a few cases where it might not be the case, where we might have to ask you to send a different version, or we might have to change things, but it is a really small minority of Cases. So, in the first instance, we'd like you to send us that manuscript because that's usually the one we can use and it saves us having to come back to you and pester you for different versions of the paper. And when do you need to do this? Well, I've said it's a, at the point of acceptance. Uh, the kind of rider to that is before you choose an option. Um, so, if the journal asks you to sign a copyright agreement as soon as you submit, or it asks you to commit to an open access option before you're formally accepted, which does happen, um, and in varying degrees depending on discipline. If they're asking you to do that before acceptance, please get in touch with us at that point before you choose the option, because we do get a lot of cases where authors have selected something and then find out later on that they've selected the wrong thing and it can be quite difficult to change it, especially if they've agreed to pay for something that turns out they don't have to pay for or we can't help them pay for. So please get in touch with us before you commit to anything because we can often save you money. Um, and as I kind of alluded to already, the maximum cutoff period is three months after acceptance. We would strongly advise you not to leave it to the last minute because it does take us a little bit of time to process things. Um, so as I've said, this policy comes into force on April 1st this year. We would really like you to start acting as if it's in force now because it's going to take you a bit of time to get used to it. It's going to take us a bit of time to get a feel for how biochemistry publication works, whether there are any special issues we need to be aware of, if there's anything we need to talk to the publishers or the funders about that's particular to your discipline. So please do start doing this straight away, really. That said, if you make any mistakes at this stage, if you've forgotten anything, if you've got past articles from the last year or so that you haven't sent through the system, don't worry. As long as it was accepted for publication before April the 1st, nothing's going to be this bad from the next ref. 
The final thing I'm going to talk about before I show you how the system works is the question of open access fees. Hefke, for the ref, don't want you to pay open access fees. So what they will say is they're really focused around this idea of putting things freely into repositories. And if the journal doesn't let you do that, or they don't let you do it with the right embargo period, Hefke have what's called exceptions to their policy. And as long as we list your article as an exception in that way and say, you tried to make it open access, but the publisher wouldn't allow it, then that's fine. That article is still eligible for the next ref. You don't have to opt for a paid for option from the publisher. That's not the case with some of the other funders. So the research councils encourage the final published version to be made available immediately on publication, and that would generally involve you paying a fee. However, if the journal allows you to deposit a manuscript in a repository with a six-month embargo or less, then they'll accept that. So that's two different sides of the policy. One of them is basically the same as the Hefke policy, except with a shorter embargo. Um, and the other one is a kind of the gold standard open access where you get the final bells and whistles published version made available immediately. The university policy is that if we can opt for the free one, the, the six month embargo and the repository one, then that's generally what we prefer because that saves money for other people who can only comply through the paid for option. That said, in the vast majority of research council funded things, um, it's not possible to go for that free option because most journals don't allow a six month embargo. So the majority of the time, um, we would end up having to pay a fee for a research council funded paper. Uh, the Wellcome Trust and COAF, well, the Wellcome Trust specifically, COAF is slightly different, but the Wellcome Trust, if there is a paid for option to make the final version immediately available, Wellcome wants us to choose that. So um, even if there's a six month embargo manuscript version option, Wellcome would want us to go for the paid for one. They'll only accept a six month embargo one in the repository if there is no paid for immediate option. So that can all be quite complicated. If you just send us the manuscript, we'll tell you exactly what applies in your case and what you need to do. The important thing for you to know is that the research councils and Wellcome and the COAF funders that I mentioned earlier provided us with block grants to cover these costs. So if it turns out the only way you can comply with these funders' policies is by paying a fee, don't worry, we will pay that for you. Um, we have. We've not run out of money for any of the years so far that this has been in operation. And if we do run out of money, we, there are you know, methods for us to apply for more. So don't be worried that there might be not enough money left in the pot or that you might be rejected for an application. We don't make any kind of judgment on the paper or where it's published or who's publishing it. If the only way that you can comply with your funder policy for research councils and COAF is to pay a fee, then we will pay that fee for you. And again, when you get in touch with us and send us your manuscript, we will check all of that out for you. And when we email you back, we will tell you, um, you know, we're going to pay this for you. Here are our billing details. And you just put those into the publisher system and the invoice comes to us. You don't have to worry about any of the finance side of things. There is a change from how things have worked previously. Um, this involves you doing things at the point of acceptance and then we give you the billing details up front. The invoice comes to us. This isn't the same as how the Wellcome Trust Fund has worked in the past. So until October of 2014, the Wellcome system was that you would just pay for it and then you'd apply for reimbursement. Um, that we, you don't do reimbursements anymore, and the reason for that is that, as I kind of mentioned earlier, we've had problems with people selecting options that either aren't the right option or don't comply with the funder policy or that were unnecessary. So the number of things we have in, for example, um, proceedings in the National Academy of Science in America. They have both a free option and they have a paid for option. And they generally funnel people towards the paid for option. Now, the, their paid for option does not comply with the Wellcome Trust policy. So if you pay for that and then apply for reimbursement, we can't reimburse you. We're not allowed under the rules of the grant. The free option, on the other hand, that does comply with the Wellcome policy. So if you get in touch with us beforehand, we just say, don't pay for it, go for that one, everything's fine. So um, hopefully it saves you money and it prevents problems happening. It's also easier for us because it means we can budget in terms of how much is available and we know if we need to go back to Wellcome and ask for more money. 
So the final thing I'm going to show you now is just what the system looks like. And hopefully, if it's all seemed really complicated up till now, it's going to reassure you that it's reasonably straightforward from your end. If you go to www.openaccess.cam.ac.uk, um, that's where the upload system is located. Uh, there's some little flyers I've left at the front there, uh, blue and white ones, which have the address on them. So if you want to take one of those and pin it in your workplace or something just to remind you, then um, yeah, that shows you where you need to go. And this is what it looks like. There's some information up at the top there, um, which you probably can't see very well. You can click on a, a learn more thing and it gives you a bit of background detail. Um, the main feature is a great big upload button, which if you click on it, it takes you to a standard file browser. You can put your manuscript in. We then ask you some very simple questions about it. This isn't a long form. It's not going to take you all morning to fill in. It's really basic kind of information that we need to process your article. So things like, what's it called? Who's the author? Who funded it? Um, where is the corresponding author based? That's pretty much it. Oh, we ask you for the acceptance date as well. Um, and that's because we need to be able to tell Hefke that this was uploaded within three months of acceptance. So if you fill in that form and click submit, that's all you need to do. That comes to us and um, we will then have a look at your manuscript. We'll have a look at who your funders are, which policies apply to it. And we'll have a look at your journal and we'll try and match them up. So we'll see, well, you need to do this. This is what the journal allows. This is the simplest way of complying with the policies. Um, what we'll then do is we'll email you back and we'll give you the simplest set of instructions we can on how you need to comply. And generally, that would be two pieces of information. One would say, to comply with HEFCI, we put this into the repository and we will do that for you. So we'll just say, we're gonna go ahead and do that. Uh, you'll have signed a, a terms and conditions that gives us permission to do that when you upload it. And probably later that day, you'll then get an email through confirming that it's in the repository. Um, the other half of the email would be, if you're funded by, let's say, BBSRC or the Wellcome Trust, you would say, you need to pay a fee to comply with this policy. Here are our billing details. Here's a reference number. Please include that on the invoice. We'll take care of it. And that's pretty much what a typical reply looks like. And then, as I said, we'll put the manuscript into the repository. We'll update it as things go on, so it has the up-to-date citation information um, once that's available. So that should be all you need to do. Um, it's a really, well, most of the feedback we get says that it's very simple. Occasionally things, you know, you get the odd article where things are more complicated, but the vast majority of the time, <coughs> it works really straightforwardly from a user's point of view. It can be quite complicated at our end, but mostly, it's very quick and very straightforward. Um, at the moment, we've not kind of got too much of a backlog. So if you send us a manuscript, we'll reply to you probably the same day. And if not, then it's certainly within 24 hours. Um, and hopefully it'll be in the repository. It'll all be sorted out <coughs> within a day. The system isn't set in stone. So we are changing things. We're in the process of upgrading the repository. We're also trying to get the website a bit more up, up to date and a bit easier to use. So. If, as you're using this system, you see anything that you think need, could be improved, needs changing, please do let us know, um, and we can try and improve that for you. Also, if you come across any issues with publishers, or you feel that there's something in the policy that's problematic for biochemistry or for your particular subfield, please do let us know, because we can talk to publishers and we can talk to the funders, and we can try and get these things ironed out. Particularly if you do it before April, then we can hopefully have some impact on the HEFCI policy before it becomes set in stone. So that's pretty much all I've got to say. There's various ways of getting in touch with us apart from the website. Info at Open Access is our email address. If you send an email there, then if you just have a general query or anything like that, we're more than happy to answer that. Um, the Open Access website I've already mentioned, OSC is the Office of Scholarly Communications website. There's a lot more kind of in-depth information on there. So if you feel you want to know more about the background for open access or you want to know what tools are out there to help you with it or anything like that, um, all that information is on the OSC website. There's also much broader kind of scholarly communication stuff on there, so things like information on research data sharing. I've also left some flies for that at the front as well. Um, information on tools, on kind of how to publicise your work. There's all kinds of useful stuff on there. 
Um, I also at the front, so I don't think there's many left, but I did leave some FAQs with that kind of summarise some of the things I've talked about and go into a bit more depth. Those are also available on the OSC website, so if you didn't manage to get a copy, then you can download them there. Um, we have a Twitter feed and a newsletter as well if people want to sign up for those. Um, so that's kind of the end of what I have to say. If you want to ask me questions, I'm more than happy to try and clarify anything. Yeah.